righty, we're live. Well, welcome everyone to our Native Wellness Power Hour. My name is Jolene Joseph, and I am a Ani from Fort Belmont, Montana, and I am also the Executive Director of the Native Wellness Institute. And I'm super, super happy today to have three of my friends and colleagues on with me. We work together on one of our local projects called the Future Generations Collaborative. And we're here for our part two of our uh, talk that we started last Wednesday on neurotrauma, specifically on fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And so we welcome you to share this with your family and friends. And um, we also want you to know that all of the Power Hours are saved um, on our Facebook page and they're also saved to our YouTube channel. So we're over 250 Power Hours now, we're at week 45. And this is the Native Wellness Institute's response to the pandemic. So we, know, we knew that an already traumatized people would be re-traumatized and we wanted to offer um, every day, some positive and uplifting uh, programming to help us all through. So I'm going to ask my um, colleagues to go ahead and introduce yourselves first. And Susie, would you like to go first? Uh, well, good. I was going to say morning, but afternoon. <laughs> my uh, I want to uh, thank you for collecting again in this circle and also for the privilege uh, of sharing the first part last week. And um, I want to encourage not only the questions that were uh, brought up from the last gathering, but that might emerge today. And so to make sure that as we talk, uh, not only uh, can you put them in the chat, but to please feel free to bring forward those questions. Cause I think particularly as we talk about strategies and all, then that you can make it yours in that way. So I just want to say as um, uh, working with the FGC through the education mode and, and working in this field of all fetal alcohol and the privilege of the lives that I've gotten to work with, I hope I can, can give respect and justice to what they've taught me to share with you. Awesome, thanks Susie. Marie, do you want to go next? Yes, hi, my name is Marie Knight. I'm originally from the Confederate Tribes of Warm Springs, and I've been living here in the Portland metro area for the last 15 years. I've been a part of the Future Generations Collaborative since February of 2013, and I'm also self-identified as having FASD. Awesome, thanks Marie. Erin? Hi, my name is Erin Angus. Um, I'm Pamunkey, Irish, and German on my dad's side. That's my dog, Yaka, means brown bear. And uh, my husband's Nez Perce, that's his language. Me um, too. And uh, on my mother's side, I'm Scottish, Irish, and German. Um, I'm a mother of three daughters and one son. And um, I've been working with Future Generations Collaborative since I don't know how long, so maybe 2015, I think. Um, and I also, th through my um, trainings with FGC, have been um, realized that I am on the spectrum as well, mm -hmm. the um, fetal alcohol spectrum. Thank awesome. You. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. So we started last week, we had an awesome conversation. Um, there was people messaging me with questions, which I thought was really good, which kind of is shaping some of what we're gonna talk about um, today. But real quickly, if we could just do a brief uh, review of last week. So Susie, would you like to go first and just share some highlights from last week? Uh, well, one of the places that were was really important to begin was to understand how it is that we have fetal alcohol among us and why uh, its origin really comes from the trauma, the environmental trauma that came to our people through boarding schools and loss of our children, of our land in those ways. And that we all know that uh, self-medicating is a strategy that we've used uh, to numb the pain. 
And so it's important to think about that because we don't ever want to look at FASD from a, a lens of shame or stigma, but we understand, want to understand it as a gift, as an opportunity to, to move forward in the ways that we always celebrate as Indigenous people of, of um, looking at the opportunity of life. Um, so that was kind of the foundational piece. And then we looked at some of the ways in which it shows up in um, our families uh, across the generations um, and that um, some of the very basic strategies that we want that we'll talk about today really have to do with when I have an FASD, it expresses or shows itself in behaviors of thinking, learning, moving, feeling, all those sensory things um, that may make us feel like we're failures and make life really quite challenging. So then we also, in talking about it, we realize that when we have those challenges as a person with an FASD, we're gonna benefit from being shown rather than told how to do things. And when we're shown um, and or told uh, uh, in concert, could you please show us what's positive, what's good about us? So we map the positive um, and we'll sort of build on that strategy. But uh, we talked about the fact that when it shows up in our lives, it might make us uh, have these responses that are reactive or explosive where things might feel too hot, too cold, too noisy too many, too much. Uh, Marie uh, talked about um, having too many directions and too many choices. Uh, Aaron talked about, and, and you guys could speak for yourselves better than I am, but uh, some of the really uh, important things that you both shared, I think were around uh, having an, a sense of structure and predictability and what organizes life in a way so it feels um, uh, manageable. And then one of the things I appreciated that you said, Aaron, he brought up was, you know, creating balance. And then in creating balance, having gratitude for that. So um, that's just kind of a, a the lining of the basket that we provided last week. And we're going to continue to hold that today. And we will fill it with some tools that will hopefully address some of the great questions that you all brought. Awesome, thank you, Susie. Marie or Erin, do you have anything to add to that? Some of the highlights from last week? <laughs> well, one of the things I wanted to add was that people that were born around my age, around the 1980s, within about 10 years of that, were really born to parents who didn't know what the effect of alcoholism or just alcohol consumption in general would have on children. And so in a sense, there's millions of people walking around undiagnosed having been affected by alcohol, even on small levels but the spectrum of it is so varying, it's really hard to kind of put a finger on it sometimes. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad you said that because that was actually one of the comments, um, one of the messages that I received from last week was somebody was sharing how um, their parents drinking was just how it was, right? Like they didn't even, um, I guess, you know, label their parents as alcoholic, but they said their parents drank like every day, but they also got up and went to work every day. They came home from work and they drank after work, you know, on weekends is when they partied really hard. And they said the same thing. Like they, nobody knew then that alcohol, you know, could impact a baby, you know, in, in the mother's womb. So really, really good point, Marie. So and today- also one more point too is that the father's sperm whether it's intoxicated or not also does have an effect on the healthy sperm regardless of whether the mother was drinking or using or not that was another point we have to remember yeah. thank you right. yes we talked about that last week as well so again if you're just tuning in this is our part two we're just doing some highlights from last week we do have the um the copy of it on our YouTube channel if you want to go back and watch last week as well. And so for today, we wanted to start off with asking the question about 
Um, the highlights included, you know, how we get FASD and kind of some of the whys. So how can FASD be prevented? So Susie, do you want to start first? Sure. Uh, I think when we think of prevention, it's really important to think of intervention. And that, again, that circle, that reciprocal circle, because prevention doesn't happen just for the mom who might be pregnant. It prevention is throughout, we need to lift all the generations. And so the very thing that Marie, that you, that you, you know, reinforced about it being not only a spectrum, but one of the reasons that it is and how it shows us up is that it, it within the norms or practices of our families, uh, you know, and as Jolene, you were saying, I might still get up and, and go to work but I am using and, and am I supported in that? I've worked uh, with families where the, the young woman was saying, I don't want to use and their grandmothers were both and great grandmother were saying, well, I used with all of you and that was fine. So it's sort of understanding that it's different for different people, uh, our diets, um, uh, the timing of our drinking, all of that impacts what it's going to look like, how it's going to show itself. And so that's a whole training and discussion, but in itself, but to look at prevention from that point of it's, we're all responsible as mothers, as fathers, as grandmothers, as children. And there is no point at which intervention uh, is not appropriate. In fact, we need to create that vision, hold that vision. The first thing we put on our basket is that vision of a healthy family and healthy babies. And what, what creates that vision? Well, we talked last week too, a lot about culturally, I mean, we are well positioned as indigenous people with all kinds of beautiful tools of practice, of talent, of ceremony, that really is gonna give us that positive, those, if, for lack of a different word, positive addiction that's going to sustain me and hold me. The really important guidance for me, uh, and I think for so many of us, is we can have a real gratitude for our ancestors who talked about the sacredness of life and the way we invite life. And the more we can grow within our family circles and our communities, that concept of inviting that sacred life. Because when I invite that life, I'm going to invite it through creating the healthiest body, the healthiest partner, the healthiest practices, the foods, but also my thoughts, my actions, all of those good things that are so much a part of our really beautiful indigenous basket of being. And so to me, those are the really important ingredients of, of prevention. And then if we are also wanting to help support bringing those good thoughts, and we actually may need to intervene with someone who is using, let's do it in a positive way. Let's bring those positive, whether it's beadwork, it's singing, it's drumming, it's, you know, what are those practices that are going to fill that mother with a good sense of self? Are we really being filled with abundance and strengths in our way of supporting and holding people up? Or are we doing it with shame and we're telling you what you're doing wrong and you're hurting your baby? Those things aren't going to change my behavior. Please hold me up to what I can do and what I'm good at and show me and give me those experiences. And if you're gonna help me with my providers, help them do the same thing and help me understand that maybe I myself, maybe I was prenatally exposed, maybe I have an FASD. So maybe that memory and those things that are challenges for me, maybe I didn't remember to come to my prenatal appointment. Please help me have and know how to do those things so that I can also not only bring my practices and traditional knowledge into and feel close to my heart, but help me move in this world with those kinds of supports and structures of systems that are also going to make me feel good and, want, and be able to do it because you're going to remind me of the 
appointments. Also, remind me with real tangible things because I'm a concrete learner. So can you give me things that are going to help me prepare for my baby? If in my way, my grandmothers have told me I can prepare the cradle board, then help me start preparing that cradle board. That's going to remind me. If it is not that, as I've had the privilege of doing with some elders, uh, as we go within really frequent multiple times within a visit and saying, I know you're, you're not making the board yet, but here's some beads, here's some, here's some material so we can contribute those things uh, in that preparation. Again, being mindful, uh, not going against any traditions that any of our peoples or, or, or families are carrying. But what are those really concrete, tangible things that frequently will remind me? And please don't just make a once a week home visit. You know, let me know that as for my providers, my family, my circle of care, my that collaborative circle of care, that I'm going to have it on a daily basis because that's going to remind me of the goodness of who I am, the health that I seek, for myself and my child and the family that I'm building. And so those are the really important elements. And in bringing this up, um, I wanted to point out that there's a booklet that we have that um, I think that we'll figure out how to get it to you, not maybe in its booklet form, but in a posted form um, that is called Life is Sacred. And it really looks at all the way from preconceptual, you know, thinking about and to then I am, I, 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 you know, I'm pregnant all the way through elderhood because there is, as we said last week, there's no time uh, that this goes away for us if we're impacted. So we really want to look at those different milestones, stages throughout life that we can lift them up in a good way. So this booklet is not about what's wrong with you, if you might have an FASD or someone else, but rather what's right with you and what you can do to make it even better. And so if we look at pregnancy, one of the things that um, I have been taught and shown uh, by the people that I've had the privilege of working with is sometimes I might be so depressed that it doesn't really matter. I might walk into the store that, uh, and, and go to get that bottle of alcohol right with a poster right today He's saying, don't drink when you're pregnant. And I might look at that and I think of all of the trauma that's happened to me in life and I go, ha, that's the least of what could harm my baby. So I'm going to discount it. So know that there are those among us who are so hurt, we really need them to, first of all, prevention is about believing in yourself. You can't make a healthy baby until you're being supported and believing in self. Nice. Thank you, Susie. Um, I put in the chat, if people uh, want some of the information that Susie is referencing, you can email info at nativewellness.com and we can email you. She put together a beautiful uh, PowerPoint that includes this Life is Sacred booklet that she's talking about. And it just helps people understand the different like ages and stages of somebody living with an FASD. So Marie or Erin, uh, do you have anything to add in terms of how can FASD be prevented? Well, the easiest answer is just don't drink. But realistically, we don't live in a black and white society. And what one of the most important things is really going to our young people and as soon as they begin to understand the concept of relationships, that's when we start the conversations about reproductive health and healthy choices. Because the two of those in you know, syncrasy creates that overall education that our young people need to know in order to make good decisions around reproduction. Because one of the biggest problems that we have around sex sexual health and reproductive health is that we are given a short, you know, like a quick view of a map that shows what reproductive, you know, re what reproduction looks like. And then we're put in a dark room with blindfolds on and just told to make our way around. And that's not the best education for you know, making a choice to bring in life. And so 
for me, re-educating our young people and continuing to educate people who are already at the point of parenthood or at the point of being pregnant or thinking about having children. It's like starting the day, like go to as young as you can and start teaching them as early as you can how to make good decisions, teaching them about you know, healthy choices, reproductive choices. And in that way, we can begin to see people making more conscious choices about when and where they have the children. Because too often we have unplanned pregnancies and we have unplanned babies that come here who, you know, have decent choices to get new starts, but oftentimes there's trauma and chaos that, that goes in that unplanned pregnancy. And so whenever we are looking at this, we got to look at where these people are, where, these, where the mother is, where the father is and where their support system is and start working from there to start building a better environment for these, for these babies and for the parents and the family. Mm -hmm. nice. Nice. Thank you, Marie. Erin, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, um, I was thinking like in prevention and intervention, um, like Marie was saying, it's obvious to tell, to tell a pregnant woman not to drink, you know, or someone, you know, is of age. I don't know, um, tell them not to drink when they're pregnant because you'll hurt, you'll hurt your baby. And um, while that's good and all, um, you, we really need to take like a, a full approach, like what that looks like and not just say, don't do that. I think, um, we need to look at why, why, are, why would you do that? Why would somebody feel the need to drink or um, abuse substances while they're pregnant and remove that? I mean, like, it, it's not that cut and dry, but like, we need a whole support system around us. Um, I remember being really young and um, pregnant at 18 and um, everyone around me was partying and um, the father, he wasn't a big partier, but you know, like he would drink too, or we, like, I didn't wanna just be alone, you know, all the time. So like, I would go to parties, but not drink. And I was like young and pregnant and pretty responsible, but I never touched it like, but I was so lonely, you know what I mean? Cause everyone around me, I had a couple of friends that would like come over and hang out with me and like bring me snacks and watch movies and stuff. And you know, that kind of thing. And then once I had the baby, like um, I didn't have any friends left, you know, I was like 19. Um, and never, you know, we all love each other, but like they just stopped calling and coming over. And I had like two really good um, girlfriends of mine that would come over. And like, I literally remember um, my friend Heidi, she would come over and like every day just after work, she'd just come over. And like she taught me how to fold laundry properly and like do all the things I didn't really know how to do on my own. I mean, I'd fold laundry, but I was like, she worked at a clothing store and showed me like how to really <laughs> hold shirts. And I just love that. Like, I don't know. I just love knowing how to do something like really nicely. And um, I, I just, ever since then I hear people complain about folding laundry, but I'm like, it's my favorite thing to do. You can sit and watch movies and just fold. And like, there's an answer to all of it. There's no, you don't have to think you can just do it. And that's one of my favorite chores to do um and it and it gives me good memories of my good friend who would come over and fold laundry with me and help with the baby and um I'll never forget those friends um and you know 10 years later they started having their kids so like <laughs> um but they were there for me and I'll never forget that and they had a community health nurse that would come over and um, do a home visit once a month and because I was a teen mom and um, they sent someone to the hospital and I agreed 
And that was like the best experience because she would come over to my little cockroach apartment with the with the old carpet and she'd just take her shoes off and come sit on the rug, you know, and she'd just basically come over and play and um, never acted like, ooh, you need to clean that up or like, what are you doing? You know, and I couldn't, I couldn't get through for like appointments or trying to apply for health care things, which I, you know, I went from getting kicked out of my house as a, you know, from like an unhealthy, you know, dysfunctional family situation, getting kicked out and like living in my friend's garage or, you know, we're just kids and we, we got pregnant and my husband got a job right away and we um, got our first apartment and it was just really fast and I didn't have any like, I didn't know what insurance was, you know, like I didn't have a bank account, like those kind of things, like mm -hmm. learning to be independent. Um, so I really appreciated those people who stepped up and like would either show me or just be there with me while I figured things out. And, um, so that that's what it looks like in like at a personal level. That's what it looks like on a systems level. Like these people are so important. We need we need more of them, and we need them from our own communities too um, to feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. and, um, I had problems going on and all, and all the nurse did is help me solve them and, yeah. and make me feel like a really great parent because I was, I just didn't know I was. Mm -hmm. so that's what it can look like to support somebody. And um, awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Erin. That was, that was awesome. And you're such that a- was beautiful. Yeah. In terms of, I just want to say thank you for, for acknowledging and looking at where the providers, the nurse, the, the support systems can work. I mean, how beautiful to hear a good story and then how good to point out, you know, the people within our community and our own ways that can be a part of that uh, traditional help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was awesome. With the providers. So um, there, there was a question, yeah, and people are asking, what's the topic for today? If you're just tuning in, our topic is on neurotrauma and in particular, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So this is actually our part two. Last Wednesday, we had our part one. So we kind of did a, a brief overview of last week. And now we're talking about, you know, how can FASD prevent it as well as, you know, how can we support people um, who are living with an FASD? And Sarah, hi, Sarah Frank says, hi, Susie. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. I saw you showing up there. <laughs> Thank you. She, she talks about the frustration, um, when, you know, talking about systems when they don't understand, you know, people's histories, people's stories, right? Everybody has a story. And so there was also another question about what if you have an FASD but you don't drink and then you have children, will your children be impacted? So Susie, do you wanna take that question? You, you guys come up you, with some great and really important questions um, because uh, again, it takes me back to what we were saying last week of this is what we think we know so far. But one of the things that we touched on a bit last week was the epigenetic is the very fancy term but sometimes it's good to have fancy terms because then people listen to you. Uh, so, <laughs> but epigenetics is really like how, how are the impacts uh, move through the generations, you know, genetically. So what we used to say, as Marie was saying, you know, well, the old just say no, you know, just don't drink. Uh, and then, you know, and we sort of took that and we did, we tried to do better than just say don't drink, but we gave prevention strategies, but we let people believe, or we thought for ourselves, well, if you don't drink, then it won't have any impact on future generations you, and you will have a healthy child. And that is true in, in, in the whole way in which the, the huge impacts, even within a spectrum impact it is the first generation where it most shows up. But current studies 
are looking at and suggesting and showing what, of course, I think we sh we would know is that it does m pass on to the next generations. So where we may not, and there are, the thing is, what the thing I most love about your question is that it is a celebration of all the people who are impacted with an FASD that have chosen not to use. And they are some of the strongest advocates and support around prevention strategies uh, because they have lived with the impacts and so they don't cho choose to use with their children and they are birthing ha healthy children. It does look like that the, the uh, next generation, while healthy and not having maybe the in organ impacts like heart, and liver, and kidney, or the really cognitive, which is the fancy, you know, thinking, academic kind of uh, impacts, those don't seem to be there. What might be there in a smaller way are those behavioral things that come out of uh, having sensory or processing impacts. And so it'll be much less, but we can be mindful that this might be a child that as they age, those very behavioral midbrain things that we talked about in terms of that kind of both bipolar mood disorders, if they will, again, they won't be so extreme, but they might be present. We might, we might want to look at them. We might look, it looks, one study looked a little bit at fine motor, that some of the speech and language development or some of the fine motor with writing seem to be a little bit impacted. But again, with intervention, you know, that was more than, than mitigated. But yes, and, and why would we think it wouldn't? I mean, it, when we realize that environmental trauma moves through the generations, why, how, how would we not have thought brain trauma would, you know? genetically, epigenetically. So that's the sort of very long response to that. And, and just to be mindful, uh, at the same time, it is something that is incredibly important to celebrate and with is great pride that I acknowledge that we have so many women who are impacted who have had very healthy births and um, are just doing super parenting. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Susie. And I think that's also good to point out that, you know, there, as we sit here on this power hour today, there's research being done, right? Like right. There's research being done on FASD and because there's always questions about, you know, well, how much, what if I drink this much and you right. know, what trimester and, you know, there's all those kind of, the research is still being done to try to figure that out, right? So the best the best bet we know is like not to not to drink to not use when when you're pregnant but sometimes we don't know we're pregnant sometimes right. for a month or two or even three right so so yeah. what can we do glad you pointed that out so if we didn't know that and that's so true for so many uh that we might not know that uh which is of course takes me to my grandmother's saying invite life you know invite it prepare for it uh but uh, so what if I don't know, and I've been pregnant for a month, two, or even three, you know, before I've really realized or I've been tuned to it, uh, is that hopeless? Should I be just be shamed and feel hor horrible about it? No, absolutely. I shouldn't. I should go, oh my goodness, maybe this, uh, I might have impacted my baby's development. I love my baby. I mean, uh, and so what can I do right now? And what I would encourage is to look at all of those things things around nutrition, lifestyle, healthy thinking, all of the good things, again, that you bring to yourself. And one of the very specific things that we know that can make a difference uh, early on is choline, uh, C-H-O-L-I-N-E. And there have been a lot of research studies over the last almost 15 years now, quite definitive in showing that that really helps the brain structure to grow. And we're even starting to use it. I've been using it as a supplement for people who are impacted. Guess what the good news about choline is? It lives in many of our traditional foods. So why do I go in some northern and different uh, countries and villages where people are still subsistence living and doing hunting and gathering? And the impacts of FASD look different because choline 
is rich within fishes and salmons and different roots that we gather. So again, here's another source of pride, another tool to think of in our basket. But uh, in the absence of that, it isn't like, well, I don't get to go out and, and get my uh, traditional food right now. We can take it as a supplement. It exists as a supplement. You can also look at it in terms of, you know, the uh, organic or store-bought foods that you buy too. So, uh, but there are many things around nutrition, which we can feel good about immediately introducing to our diet uh, when we know we're pregnant and think we might have used. Mm -hmm. Nice, thank you, Susie. So we've talked a little bit about, um, you know, what it's like to live with an FASD, um, what, what parents need to know. Can you all touch on, um, you know, what do teachers need to know and what do supervisors, you know, our workplaces need to know, right? Because we've talked about FASD isn't just when you're a baby, it's, it's, a, life, it's a lifelong thing, right? right? So as you go along in your life, you know, stages and ages. So what, are, what do parents, teachers and supervisors need to know? I want to jump on a bit of that and then I want to defer to them, but I am filled with feeling and passion around the response to this because I just came from a meeting in which we were discussing our children that are being expelled and suspended uh, from preschool age all the way through from schools. And the many of them who are impacted by an FSD, they may or may not know it, but their behaviors are indicative of that explosive uh, reaction. And so, um, and, uh, and then especially when we have some children who have what they call co-occurring, uh, I might have both an FASD and I might have an ASD, autism. And so that might make me really reactive with, in terms of my senses of sight, sound, feeling, uh, et cetera, to my environment. I may not know where my body is in space. So if we look at these characteristics that we're considering around FASD, I might be that child who is sitting there and I keep getting in trouble and my teacher is putting me on a timeout or taking me out of the room, uh, repeatedly going to the principal and then eventually it's decided that I'll be suspended because surely I will learn from my mistakes. Well, no, surely I won't because I haven't stored that memory. So then I not only feel more like a failure, but I'm starting to get angry and angrier depending on the age and stage. If I'm little, maybe not so much by high school, I really am reacting. But in any case, then it's decided I just need to be expelled. And then someone comes in uh, and hopefully it's the parent knowing their rights and responsibilities and says, I'd like to have somebody else come and observe my child. And so then as somebody working in the field, we go in and we look and we see that uh, Susie is sitting there uh, for a moment, but the teacher's talking and there's instructions and clearly Susie's not paying attention. She it looks like she isn't understanding, but she starts to write on her paper because she sees she's looking around and she's gonna be her environment. She's just gonna copy what others are doing. So I'm trying to write on my paper and Susie uh, and I, as Susie cannot stay on my paper because I don't really know where my body is in space. So I accidentally, uh, my writing goes on, on Johnny's paper and Johnny goes, stop it. And then, and then now I'm feeling really over uh, uh, excited about what's happening. And so I'm trying not, but I'm doing it again. And then he's getting mad at me. And then the teacher's saying, you need to stop writing on Johnny's paper, Susie. And so I jump up and I just put my hands over my ears and then people are starting to yell at me. And so I run around the room and I start pulling all the posters off and anything I can grab a hold of because I am, I am beyond being able to self-regulate way beyond. And so I've done that enough times that my kindergarten teacher says, Susie, uh, we need to have, you can't come tomorrow and we're gonna need to have a talk with your mom. And you tell my mom that I'm suspended and then it goes from there. And then mom brings in a provider uh, in FASD and says, oh, wow, let's watch Susie. Wow, I can see she doesn't know where to work. Here's a piece of map board, Susie. Here's your space to write. Can you write 
put your paper inside of this mat board that has the nice green collar that will be calming to you or terracotta brown mud. <laughs> and um, I put my paper on it and I can't believe it. I know where to be. And all of a sudden I'm doing my work on that and that behavior is gone and I didn't need to be expelled. So I know that was a long story about a little thing, but it's in so many ways throughout the ages and stages. This is what I'd like to share with parents is you have the power. You have by statute, by law, the primary responsibility and right to express your child's needs. And in so doing, you can request that your child's needs, you know, be served to do that then as a parent, I hope someone will help me feel comfortable to learn about my child so I can really understand how to best serve and have people that will come in and speak for them. And then it might be that it ends up being developed into something that's called an um, uh, intervention family service plan, which is an IFSP, or in school, it might be an IEP, in, 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 yeah individual education plan mm -hmm. or in employment then there is employment an ipe so all the through all life i can have plans that will help me schedule help me structure and they will make me successful because again as we said last week i'm not smart it's not about being smart or stupid i learn differently please show me and if you show me what i'm doing right that will be part of my strategy. And then on build that, give me uh, and those who work with me an idea of what those strategies are that fit me, because they're gonna be different for different people. But adaptation, we all do it. We wouldn't survive. We wouldn't have, it, be here today if we hadn't learned to adapt to our environment. So all that these things do, these fancy terms that sometimes push us away and go, well, you're not going to give my child an IEP because that makes them look stupid. No, those are the successes. The people that I told the stories, the pediatrician, the neurologist, some of the artists and musicians I've worked with. They, they, I mean, they are incredible people of incredible talent and service to humanity, but it's because they had that predictable structure and way of knowing how to use their strengths to address their challenges. And so that other people would know that no, Susie's not this willful disobedient child that won't do and be like everyone else, but rather there, Susie has something unique and special to offer, and I'm gonna help that. Again, I'm gonna hold up that mirror to show her beauty, not the beauty that I think I want her to have, but what is her real beauty. Excellent, that was so beautiful, Susie. Thank you so much. Um, it reminds me of the, the one time we had this youth gathering and we were in this big gym. There was like, you know, over a hundred people in there, just lots of stuff going on. It was time to get started. And we asked everyone to come and sit in a circle. And one of the, the young people went over to this table where we had all these craft items and they found this big piece of felt, like a big blanket almost. And they took that and they went and sat in the corner and they put that blanket over them. So I knew because I had my FASD lens on because what I've learned from you is that they were self-regulating. They were trying to make themselves okay with these bright lights and all this, all these people and all this stuff going on. And their chaperone was trying to go over there and rip the blanket off and make them come sit in the circle. <laughs> yep. And I ran over there and I go, no, 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 it's fine. Just, you know, just, you know, they're okay over there. Just leave them, you know? And so I think that's why it's so good that we're having this conversation because we begin to see ourselves or we begin to see other people that, we, that we're parenting or that we're teaching or that we're supervising, right? And how can we help them be successful? So that's awesome. a beautiful story. And what I like about that is like other, though those really concrete because if you're gonna help me, whether it's in the school uh, or it's an employment or as a parent, please do it in these concrete ways. Can I tell one other story about you, Jolene? 
<laughs> because it's a really, it's a beautiful story of what you did in the youth camp. And I had the privilege of working with the uh, one of the young men that were a part of it. And he, uh, because if I have brain damage, I may also have, you know, environmental trauma. I might have both kinds of trauma. And so in this person's case, he had both. And as so many uh, of us might and, and do. And so he was really needing to know how to express that in a nonviolent way because things would erupt. He was the grown up version of tearing the posters off the wall. And so you led him up a hill and you had him roll down a rock. And what he expressed to me is that with every bounce, it concretely for him, that was the release of, he goes, I went, ah, that's that hurt. Ah, that's that hurt. And so when you, he was expressing that story and then I found that you were the one done it. It was like, that is such a beautiful illustration of the very kind of thing that, if we think about, you know, this is sort of like a puzzle um, it, that w we, when we have the privilege to be a part of somebody's life, whether it's the parents or the children or both, is it's a puzzle. And each of us has a slightly different puzzle with slightly different parts. But if we think about them again, in terms of their strengths and as well as their needs, then we can know you, that story to me illustrates this perfect response to that that tactile concrete sensory thing that worked for him it might not work for somebody else it might be something different but i would encourage us all as parents caregivers providers you think about that in that unique way and to do that what does it ask us to do it takes us back to what i talked to yesterday this is the gift this is the gift of the compassion that is best generated, best discovered and created through observation, respectful observation, not looking for it, truly meeting you where you are, not looking at for who I we want to be, but I wanna see that beauty of you and I wanna use that. And then I will design those interventions. And I will know some basic things like, please show me. And I will know that I will benefit if you can create a nice cozy sheepskin retreat space for me, I can go there or I can take the felt blanket. But um, I'm, I'm sorry, I know I took a bunch of time with that story, but I'm still struck with what you did with that young man that was so helpful. <laughs> oh, thank you, Susie. Well, what about, um places of work, you know, the, the people that I have known, um, and I, and I had a friend share with me about being on time, like they struggle with being on time, you know, not just at work, but like anywhere. Right. And it doesn't mean that everybody that's late has an FASD, but certainly it, that, that could be. So how can we, what do employers need to know and how can we help, um, uh, people that identify that are working to be more successful. Um, I actually wanted to say a few words about that because this kind of actually applies to parents, teachers, and employers. Just understand it's really not your job to fix the individual. It's your job to kind of empower them because a lot of times one of the problems that people have in dealing with someone that has an FASD is that viewing them as doing something wrong that has to be fixed or corrected. That mm -hmm. doesn't really work. And also just the idea of separation from the group. Understand that if you have an FASD, separation from the group is more of a comfort rather than a punishment. Even if you view it as a punishment, I know that when I was a kid and I was told to go and time out, it was kind of a relief because then <laughs> I can go and just be by myself for a minute. And so the other thing too is like changing the action words you tell them like don't instead of telling someone what not to do give them a different way like how people tell their kids don't run instead of saying don't run tell them to walk can you walk slow down give them a alternative action and that those are just what i wanted to add in there perfect Awesome. Thank you, Marie. How about you, Erin? Do you have anything to add in there? I was thinking about um, 
sensory things like um when I when I start to escalate emotionally and get overwhelmed and things like I I want to like I don't want to fight I don't want to argue but that's what's going to happen if I try and like use my voice during that time so what I want is someone to see that before I have to like say something and like probably like a tight hug or a squeeze or something and we can't always have that or maybe we already flew off the handle and nobody nobody wants to hug you right now <laughs> no um but I was thinking um it's just like the sensory thing and you want to calm down but I was thinking like in doing movement exercises and and trying to um help my body heal um like recently I was thinking of that because once I engaged my whole body and got a good workout in like then for the rest of the day I'm like this like I kept moving because you got to move everything's all awake and loose now but um every time I moved like it it's kind of like that hurts so good pain they talk about when you work out and um it that's what I associate it with I'm like it's an it's a big hug it's what it feels like but it's from the inside and that is something that's so important for everyone but especially people with an FASD to feel where your body is in space we need to activate our body and be active and find ways to be active um whatever our physical abilities will allow mm -hmm. but um that's really important um way to self-regulate because it I mean it, it fills that need but you're creating it for yourself you don't have to rely on others all the time to calm you down nice that's really awesome. nicely said yeah yes awesome well I think another big part for parents or teachers or employers as well is just like information right information about what is FASD and um so we put, if you're just tuning in earlier, um, we have some great resources that Susie has put together. You can email um, info at nativewellness.com and we can email those to you. It's already like one o'clock. That hour just like flew by again. And I feel like we need a part three. <laughs> keep the conversation going and to, to keep the teachings going. So maybe we'll check our calendars and see if we can get scheduled again for a part three. But we want to thank everyone for tuning in. Again, the topic today was on neurotrauma and specifically fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Because of, um, you know, I always call it chemical warfare, the introduction of alcohol in our communities. And uh, because so many people use it as a coping mechanism, like FASD is in our families, it's in our communities. And this is in part why we wanted to, you know, do these sessions on FASD to provide that education and awareness and um, to help people, you know, al along your healing journey. So thank you, Susie. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Erin. Thank you, Shailene, for doing our producing in the background. Yeah. <laughs> We're happy that you tuned in. Please continue to tune in every day at noon Pacific time, same time, same place. Every day we're here with different workshops and things like that. And we hope you all have a great rest of your day and we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.